Amanda is an artist, um, currently LA based, but he's, she's British. We met two years ago in March when she presented a really awesome paper at this conference in New York's new school called, uh, in a conference called Post-Planetary Capitalism. And then we kind of like developed a strong bond and kept that going through email, through other projects. I just presented at a conference she organized in Newcastle. I've also had a chance to travel to LA. So this, this like is a kind of an ongoing conversation we've been having. And I'm very proud that she's sort of like giving us sort of like a gist of her, the research of the last few years of her work on problematizing contemporary art in today's paper. Amanda is an artist and writer living in Los Angeles. Her work has been featured in What Hope Looks Like After Hope, Beirut City Forum, November 2015, Agitationism, The Irish Biennial, L'Avenir, Montreal Biennale, 2014, and Speculative Aesthetics, Tate Britain, 2015. Beach's writing includes essays for the anthology Speculative Aesthetics, Urbanomic, 2014, Realism, Materialism, Art, from Sternberg Press, 2015, and catalog contributions for the Irish and Montreal biennials. Her artist books include First Machine, 2015, Final Machine, 2013, and Sanity Assassin, 2010. Beach is Dean of Critical Studies at CalArts, California, USA. Amanda. Well, thank you, Mo. Um, Thanks very much, everyone, for coming here today. Um, it was a great day yesterday, so hopefully we can try and match that. Um, I also um, just want to kind of pre-thank pre my fellow speakers, who I'm really excited about um, hearing their papers today, and also to thank um, the people who've organized the whole event. It's great to participate in something like this. Um, I'm going to read a paper. Um, so I'll just work through it, and of course we'll have time for questions, I think. We can do that afterwards. Um, but I know there's also a round table, isn't there, at the end of the day, so if there's kind of points that you want to kind of reflect on with a bit more time, then that's also fine too. Okay, um, so I'll just work through this. Um, and it, I don't think I'll be talking for more than half an hour, but something like that. Okay. So, an anti-realist art makes explicit the constructed nature of the operations, habits, and structures of our perceived lived reality in order to revise the fundamental structure of the rules that govern its construction. So this, what I'm describing, is a critique of the given. And by the given, I mean that it's a critique that opposes the idea that there is a God-given nature that is unable to be put into question by us. So in identifying such power as a myth, as appearance, it is claimed that art might provide us with the means to produce a different future. This mode of critique has defined art as a space of reason and art as a form of cognitive labor. So in other words, when I say cognition, reason in that sense around art, I'm basically saying that from the kind of moment of when we might start thinking about art being conceptual. So critical anti-realist practices that do the kind of stuff I was just describing are familiar to us in more or less standardized methods of institutional critique. But I believe that a kind of dogmatic, skeptical anti-realism factors as a latent characteristic of many modern and postmodern critical practices, even those that do not claim to reveal the false nature of a given reality as a means to oppose it. So I'll speak to the diversity of these practices in more detail shortly. But what's particularly concerning regarding the, rule, the role of reason in questioning the rules and systems that subtend the way things are is how a critique of the place we find ourselves in is quickly turned into a form of introspection by art to art and its very nature. So here we see art question, or at least work upon itself. Contemporary art begs the question of its right to exist by asking for, but not necessarily giving reasons for its existence. So this self-questioning practice has problematic consequences and characteristics. 
Art is a process of involution, is a self-producing machine that performs its own identity through its self-conscious critique. This is claimed as a critique without grounds and without end. Every artwork sustains a referent to the notion of art, but what this word means, art, is claimed as unknowable and without rule. This idea of art constructs a myth of the deontic, infinite autonomy of art as process. Art that invests in this notion becomes a format of patterns, of coded activity, where self-questioning performs a self-effacing operation. So art that thinks humility must also think the borders of the human. It tells us mainly that humans are special and also weak. They produce situations but cannot change anything. Crucially, I'll draw this out in this talk um, and look at some core contradictions and problems with this approach to and by art. For what is repurposed for this critique is A, an overcoded skepticism of representational images, and B, a naive valorization of the unfathomable identity of a human psyche. So here, in this last point, this idea of the unfathomable identity of the human psyche, we see the irreducibility of mind and art that are bound together and they become framed as the given in their own right. Ironically, through a practice that claims to be suspicious of such truth claims, another one is enforced. In this scenario, art becomes no more than the reflection of a reified human identity, a mirror of human nature. This connection between the irreducibility of mind and the infinity of art means that art struggles to interfere or interact with anything beyond its self-produced borders. Its claims that anything can be within its borders is just banal. So already I've kind of identified three sets or categories to unpick. Art, self-conception, and political transformation. And I want to hold on to the possibility throughout my talk for the revolutionary capacity of art. This would be an art that would be able to revise its rules that govern it. To do so, we must first accept that rules and norms exist, right? So just to even go there um, confronts this myth of art um, as being ruleless and open. And I'm going to talk about that in a bit more detail now. So this question of rule and normativity is crucial when we know that art's political force has often been grounded in a concept of the opposite, that is, the ruleless or the convention-free. Furthermore, it might seem strange that this interaction, interrogation, autonomy and consequent involution of art towards its self-definition has been connected to the self-transformation of both art and people, or in other words, that, has, that it has political cause. So how is this notion of ruleless political cause characterized? So the feel-good self-assurance of a finite and humble human figures this critical space. This false humility is glued into place by the idea that we can never know ourselves. This is the mystery that fixates and standardizes art as an anti-realist project and also standardizes the human itself. Here, art is undergirded by the dialectical tension between the task that we must understand ourselves as thinking subjects and the notion that human consciousness is irreducible to the forms of knowledge that might explain it. In art, this factor of irreducibility is often idealized as being equivalent to a sensory or pre-linguistic experience, particularly identified in affect-based or phenomenological practices, cultic aesthetics, in aesthetics, and so on. It's also figures, figured as horror, the horror of knowledge, where Dr. Xavier's X-ray eyes see all too much. He tears them out in a form of violence, the kind of which Oedipus never experienced. So some forms of knowledge are just too much for the fragile yet lumpen humankind. So a maximal perceptual vision 
that is equivalent to cognitive capacity is fated to horror at the level of terror. As such perception is limited, as such perception is limited and unknown becomes the saving grace of the true horrors of reason. So I'll just explain that a little bit more um, in a moment. But it's, it is tempting to outline and berate the diverse forms of phenomenology, vitalism, um, and effectual and immersive arts practices that foreground raw sensation as an antidote to a rationalism. The reason that thinks rationalism in this case is narrow-minded, rationalism is perceived as only instrumental, producing a bureaucratic form of culture at best and instantiating the imminence of totalitarian horror at worst. Representationalism, so it follows, can only be conservative and prohibitive for change. And realism has been understood to manifest the artificiality of the image as a form of uncritically consumed nature that invites in ideological dominance. These claims that seek to privilege the sensory as something that can exceed the dominant language of formal difference does so with little authority. It invokes representationalism instead in a naive way because this experience of pure sensation fails to establish any new rules for art and it remains framed as and called art in, a, in its most standard condition. Whilst art is also characterized as the infinite site of an enigmatic concrete materialism in affect-based practices, its infinite character as genre is claimed also in post-structural practices. Here revision and interpretive discourse enable art um, and it's being claimed to potentialize the anything um, in an infinite field of language. So Julie, for both affect-driven practices and practices that we might see in post-structural theory like remix or appropriation art, um, art has political cause because it's always open. And as such, the political goes nowhere and everywhere. In brief, change is seen to emanate magically in the spaces that seem to refuse mastery or explanatory vocabularies. So across all these practices that I'm kind of invoking here, we see an abstract gesture and a general commitment to another belief that cannot be put into question, nor can these practices redress. This is the naive transcendental belief that art is ultimately irreducible to reason in either its substantive material data or its durational process. So what is highlighted here is the primacy of art self-awareness as to how these borders are constituted between the human and the non-human. This basis, this basis of distinction formats various dualisms that enable this project. These can be seen to operate between reason and the senses, the linguistic and the non-linguistic, between organic and the inorganic, between reality and appearance. Ironically, these dualisms manifest in art as a total condition. And this is an art that's really familiar to us, a space where irreducibility is thingified as genre form. By this token, we can say that art acts as a form of representational self-mapping that claims the truth of art as art. It is a topographic practice that resides in a hubristic self-assurance that it knows how to set and police the border of reason and unreason. But these are founded upon a set of incorrect mythologies. And I hope that's really clear that what I'm describing is something I'm really not happy with. Um, if art's critique of myth is supported with other myths, then we must start again with a revision of reason. So I want to just expand on this a little bit more by kind of doing something through art history, which I don't really do at all, so let's try. Um, I want to expand on it with a view from um, Clement Greenberg's essay, Avant Garde and Kitsch, which I'm sure some of you have been taught as art students. Um, this essay anticipates the problem of a mimetic art by making the distinction between an avant-gardist art that imitates itself through aesthetic modification and, and an art of a problematic kitchen philistinistic social realism that imitates life. So Greenberg's making like a really core distinction between two kinds of art, 
we can see that the former, an art that imitates art, and one that leads inevitably towards an aesthetic of pure abstraction, includes the human in its dimension. And this is where Greenberg's political claim lies. This human self-conscious dimension is important to Greenberg because in a Kantian sense, Greenbergian pure abstraction is now the manifest image of a form of civilized becoming, a genealogy of art and human consciousness together in as much as the abstract image is not represents the fulfillment of an emancipatory moment of real autonomy. Art in the context of this high modernist project, as a kind of consciously asserted action, connects self-imitation, self-conservation, and self-transformation. The project of art imitating art must require that art is stable enough that it can act as a form of ground itself or nature that is available for recursion. So in Greenbergian formalism, the name art is an expression of something that mirrors and corresponds to an external world by dint of its ability to access its own ideal nature. This correspondence between art and its larger history, that is, between the artwork and art, is where art secures its emancipatory political claim. But self-imitation requires self-consciousness and a kind of explication of art as material and historically constructed form. And it's here where mimetic method, i.e. art as the process of the adherence to and copy of an existing artistic critical method, squares with the ideology of the mirror. And of course, the mirror is the ideology that Greenberg is seeking to oppose. So whilst social realism and Greenbergian formalism might look different, they are in fact united in their commitment to a mimetic self-consciousness. The inward-facing avant-gardist project that claimed an art of the real, where subjective expression meets the universalism of the great outdoors, and the social realist art as a mirror of empirical reality, a life in the world, conflate in their predilection to representational economies that they both claim to divest themselves of. Greenberg's realism produces a new abstract figuration that dissolves foreground and background, and in doing so, makes one horrific abstraction, a kind of picturing where forms of delirious aesthetic experience encountered at the heart of an abstract sublime are ultimately mimetic stabilizing forces. The imitation that once promised freedom for Greenberg condemns itself to the order of social realist kitsch, which he despised as the default towards irrational consumption. Consequently, we can be sure that one cannot flee the space of mediation, and it is incorrect to oppose the sensory realm of pure abstraction born of a cultivated self-consciousness to the territories of a philistinistic doctrinaire representational realism. So I hope we can see that a legacy of this historicist genealogical, uh, genealogical approach to art produces another form of self-consciousness that sought to reflect upon this principle, namely in conceptual art. Rather than manifest a reactionary revitalization of social realism in an ironic representational art, uh, as to, like, say, critique or oppose Greenberg, conceptual art produced other forms of abstract representationalism that turned out to expand this naive realism towards the realm of the concept. Whilst claiming a scientific approach to linguistics and epistemology, this work ultimately rendered an aesthetics that perpetuated a form of naive structure of cause and idea. In such case, we can see conceptualism as an extension of formalism as opposed to some radical break with it. A conceptual art that would claim to work under materialism as opposed to formalism serves to revalidate a critical self-conscious method that just like Greenbergian formalism highlights the problem of a spontaneous representationalism. So by spontaneous representationalism, I mean that um, there's a kind of pathology to representation um, that they assume they can escape from by working with the primacy of the concept. So they, they oppose the concept to representation, and that's a 
like, again, a kind of incorrect um, mythology of this kind of practice. So from this perspective, a Kantian complex of a sublime image and political he autonomy pervades art as a spontaneous process and condition. It seems to be an expression of the very nature of critique and something that is therefore unavoidable. How might art understand or even overcome this correlation between mirroring irreducibility and its political critical claim? If art is to take up the task of realism, which I would like it to, how might we begin an art of a radical consciousness without these forms of regressive self-consciousness? So I'm gonna kind of just ask a couple of questions now and kind of try and think about what I've just said. So if I'm, if I'm asking for an art that is capable of critiquing its own production of myth, then I need to make a careful distinction between an art that illuminates what it identifies as the givenness of any situation and an art that can critique the given as a presupposition or myth by involving itself in the rules that govern the production of these realities. And I just want to make it kind of clear that I see these as really distinct methods and that they don't necessarily um, work together. So to say that art is a thing that can make commitments means that we must let go of the romance of the pre-rational state of art and make art that moves beyond this production of its self-definition. Their opposites, the, these opposites, romance and formalism, have so far been supported by an ethics of indeterminacy. To recover art from this dilemma, we must acknowledge the following points. The first is that we do not have to choose between an instrumental rationalist art and a mystical non-explanatory experience. The choice just doesn't exist. Secondly, the relations between anti-realism and representationalism and between self-conception and voluntaristic freedom are severed. And third, the sense experience of artistic material is not something that can be freed from the concept of art as a rationalizing descriptor. These categories are not correct, or at least insubstantive enough, that one cannot employ them as grounds to destroy or idealize from. So instead, we need to revise the concept of art as a rule that no longer founds its value on incorrect comprehensions of how things are. The need to think thought, or in other words, to examine the operations and structure of consciousness, however, should not lead us to the panic of a regressive ontology, a kind of hall of mirrors, where the languages that think the structure of consciousness are compelled towards a spiral of a horrific self-reference, i.e. The, the thinking of thinking of thinking of thinking, this kind of spiral of self-reference that's kind of like this horrific space. And um, this is kind of Quine's uh, fear of ontological relativity. And as Donald Davidson remarks, and he quote, it's not that reference is not relative, but that there is no intelligible way of relativizing it that justifies the concept of ontological relativity. So, end quote, nor should it mean that this apparently pre-political, apparently pre-analytical space that pathologically thinks thought is fated to the impenetrability of analysis and explanation. Rather, mastery is set in parallel with the weak background of our pathology, the latter of which will also act as its supplement. So, Julie, we can think about an art that might enter the space of reason without correlating the operations of reason to human identity. This is what I'm trying to kind of work on as my long-term project. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about um, what I mean, how I am identifying this problem before I think a bit more about a way through it. So I guess, you know, what I've been trying to talk about today is how to produce a realist art. And of course, I've made a really clear distinction, I hope, between a realist art and a social realist art, um, the one that I'm kind of classifying as a problem in uh, standard social realism, but also identifying social realist art as a kind of um, moment um, that, or a character that haunts 
many kinds of artistic practice. So the task of a realist art in this case is to refuse a transcendental negativity that designates the limits of finitude of reason. If we are to move away from this self-image as the conclusion of any political project, then this begs the question of a metaphysics. The manifestation of the understanding in and by art in a correct image, of course, risks the possibility of illustrating metaphysics, which is correlating the form of the image to the thought of the real. This would perform the old contradiction where art would simultaneously be correlative to the real via epistemology, whilst inadequate to the real, since all art can do is talk about it. So to approach this problem differently then, we can argue that there is no critical stance that is independent from the given reality that it observes or from which such observations spring. Truth claims do not require an empiricism that would map appearance to reality negatively or positively. The question of critique then is not a question of whether the artwork is tied to an idea of lived empirical reality, i.e. does it represent reality well? Um, so it's not that, that's not the question for a critical art, um, nor is it a question that it can be freed from that reality, okay? So rather we, we face the question of how the artwork addresses reality as it ought to be through being cognizant of the conditions from which we speak. Now, the philosopher theorist Robert Brandon makes a useful distinction between reason and pathology, and I'm going to just talk about that for a little bit because I think it's going to help work this out. He also makes a distinction between sapience and sentience. And this division might lead us to identify the way in which art produces extensional commitments that can move beyond an involutionary or normative self-referential practice. In his essay, Intentionality in Language, a Normative Pragmatic Inferentialist Approach, he draws a distinction between practical and discursive intentionality and representational and propositional intentionality. So here, for Brandon, practical intentionality is a form of sentience where rules are repeated and established in practical modes of survival, whereas discursive intentionality is that exhibited by concept users in the richest sense. That's a quote. And is exhibited by language users, ones who can say what they are thinking and talking about. That's another quote from Brandon. So we can see that representational intentionality, quote, expresses what we are thinking and talking about, end quote, and propositional intentionality expresses, quote, what we are saying about it, end quote. As such, representations are understood as non-discursive and practical and propositions are considered as discursive operations, even though neither is exempt from the other. So one of Brandom's examples of representational images that, as I've just said, have some propositional content is the map. The map is not a discursive image in the sense that it supports a basic use function. Similarly, Wilfred Sellers, the uh, person who um, Brandon also draws upon a lot in his work, discusses the relation between mapping and basic representational functions in his book, Mental Events. For Sellers, the map function speaks to a place where the non-linguistic and linguistic representational systems conjoin or overlap. He talks about how an organism, quote, constructs maps of itself in its environment and locates itself and its behavior on the map, end quote. Sellers writes, quote, undoubtedly a primitive representational system is also an innate endowment of human beings, end quote. So this nature to represent, refer, and characterize for sellers, albeit a nature of the human, is distinct from logic using representational systems that allow a core <coughs> distinction between sapience and sentience. So what's significant here when we examine our artistic anti-realist critique, the one that I've been complaining about for half of this talk, and when we, when we look at that in parallel with Brandom and Seller's description of representational pathologies 
or representational primitives, is how what has been historically characterized as art's core conceptual content is in fact more akin to this basic primitive representationalist form of mapping what there is. Here, reason operates as a form of pathology, pathological survival without extending to other forms of reason that would challenge or change these patterns. So the kind of horror to this is that what, what I think we've been, we, the art world, have been going around calling like its highest um, uh, expression of cognitive labor in art is actually just basic primitive representational mapping. So to furnish this point with a quite a literal example, um, about a year ago, I was shown in a talk in LA, someone gave a talk, and they showed a Google map, uh, like Google Earth map, and where freeways um, were all broken because the map had broken when you go to a certain point, and you, I'm sure everyone's seen those kind of examples where the map breaks. Um, so this is, that was talked about by this person um, to say that when the map was broken, when we saw it break, that we were kind of exposed to the kind of truth um, of that it was a map. <laughs> that we didn't think about it as a map until we saw it, it, that, that it as a tool, it was broken. So, so the claim there is that I was kind of made aware of something because it was not working, right? Now, I think... They weren't talking about an artwork, they're talking about Google Earth, but I think that that is a very standard thing um, to say about art. Um, it's a very kind of classic mode of like purchasing critique in art. Because it's not functioning, then it's really uh, wonderful and open and funct functioning in this kind of um, o open and banal way that I've called. So I think that we can say that knowing that the map is a map does not demand any inferential commitments, or at least if it does, these are really minimal. And we are returned back towards a self-reflection on both our knowledge of a thing's artifice and the map being a map. This declaration of knowing seems to go nowhere in particular, albeit it produces space. I think this gesture to reason sustains a long-term characterization of art's critical attitude in contemporary culture. The act of pointing out what there is um, what is there, locates what is there, and solidifies the act of critique as a work of locating and identifying objects as constructions. But there is little value in this recognition itself because no constructive work happens beyond this internalization. The statement that this is a map has no relation to the functional operations of such maps, <coughs> nor does it access the map beneath its representational function. The map just continues unaware. So I'm going to talk finally about when I use that word inferential and that other word commitment, I'm going to put the two together um, and try and talk about that for a moment. And inferential commitments establish a key difference between the propositional and this <coughs> representational um, operation for Brandom. And this is where a commitment that is established by concept users to ideas, beliefs, and things requires that this commitment be extended to other inferred commitments that this initial address implies. So saying something is the way it is does not require an inferential commitment. These may be present, but only at such, again, a really minimal level. As I've outlined, this mapping not only locates the human via an ontological definition of art, but it also is a mimetic form of human production, a mirror that is the locating device of a representational topography. So because of this organized failure to produce a cognitive account of the condition of the image, anti-realist critique, as such that I've described, falls under the role of rule following rather than rule producing. It can be seen as a form of basic survival, a form of sapience rather than a transformative form of governance that can produce that can produce rule, since following Brandon, quote, discursive norms govern the deployment of judgeable, that is, propositional, intentional content, end quote. In the face of this, we must ask ourselves to be vigilant about the norms we pr produce and follow. While such a practice of mapping may be a necessary expression of the human, 
It does not have to be the end point from, for an artistic critical practice. Commitment is not an intuitive leap brought about through practical relations and already established connections between objects and beliefs. Neither is it a skepticism of language by thought. Since following Donald Davidson, Brandom agrees that, quote, neither language nor thinking can be fully explained in terms of the other, and neither has conceptual priority, end quote. This assertion, however, does not determine a new space of aporia or ambiguity. Rather, this relational view is central to the constitution of public social linguistic practices that are, quote, from Brandon, intelligible only in the context of implicitly normative social linguistic practices, end quote. So following Kant, Brandon argues that discursive creatures, humans, express commitment responsibility, endorsement, and authority over the claims that they make, and that, quote, these are all normative concepts, end quote. Here, judgments about objects require commitment. Brandom says, quote, the difference between discursive and non-discursive creatures is not, as Descartes had thought, an ontological one, but a deontological, that is, a normative one, the ability to bind <laughs> oneself to concepts which are understood as a kind of rule, end quote. Being bound to concepts that are understood as normative or rule-based is distinctly different to art's idealization of the open, to free will, and to a knowledge that transcendentally expresses the problem of pure autonomy. What Brandom offers is a way to articulate a non-traditional metaphysics of art. This is non-traditional in the sense that representational work is understood as the construction of necessary mediations that are discursive due to their propositional and normative character. So Brandon's work highlights the destitution of cultural horizons for the kind of artistic anti-realisms that I've been describing and the naive predilection <coughs> towards an art of sentience or inferential, inferential materialism over sapience, the ability to commit to the production of explanatory and reducible forms of explication. So to finish up, I'm just gonna say that it's really important for us to now extrapolate a distinction between the methods of a scientific realism as a project of inferentialism and self-conscious knowledge as a project of transcendence. And to make this distinction between these two factors in order to organize a cultural practice that pursues a cognitive understanding of the conditions in which it finds itself, but crucially refuses to situate these findings as a negatively charged, real, ideal, identarian foundation by which to oppose and anchor a banal, undirected hope for the future. The necessity and urgency of understanding how creative practices operate at the level of representation, intentional proposition, intuition and cognition then is key. This is because we know that ideas, actions and systems do not emerge from nowhere and we are often compelled to work with systems that we cannot always defend as correct or true to the extent um, the way in which we may find ourselves adopting grounds for inference that can only be defended heuristically. So in light of these demands, the task for culture then <coughs> is to comprehend the role of consciousness in relation to critique more correctly, right? Or just correctly. A culture that is critical or skeptical of the circumstances in which it finds itself should not be involved in the legacy of Cartesian paranoia, the kind of which we have been discussing today. Um, rather, this must be a culture with rule, one that ultimately disposes of myths that have already been proven as incorrect. To behave according to this rule is now the task of a culture that rigorously projects without mirrors. This is a culture of a rational imaginary, a casting off of the DNA of self-doubt, a kind of overcoming of this um, ethics of the humble towards an operation that is grounded in a new epistemology, one that requires a rigorous consciousness that comprehends the grounds as systems that it interacts with and produces, but with no anticipation of their limits. That's it, thanks. <laughs>